Alexander Nikolaevich Skriabin was born on Christmas Day in Moscow in 1872. With, it sort of fits his megalomaniacal personality, and he enjoyed that fact very much. <laughs> there, there is something horrible but grisly amusing of the fact that he died on Easter. <laughs> Of course, that was actually tragic and horrible and unattended, and he probably could have been saved by antibiotics because it was an infection that got out of hand. Um, he was only 43 and was hard at work on his last work, The Mysterium. It has several different titles, actually. He was one of the most fascinating and peculiar personalities in Western music. He was not only a prodigious child, I think he was destined to be anyway. His mother was a distinguished concert pianist who died before he was one, and he was raised in a rather hothouse atmosphere by a grandmother and an aunt. His father was a diplomat who was away a lot of the time. Um, I think the child was, was going to be a genius whether he was or not. <laughs> but in this case, it's, he certainly was. He devoured Greek, Latin, mathematics, and started studying music at a precocious early age. And by the time he was 15, he'd produced his actual first masterpiece, the famous Etude in C-sharp minor, Opus 2, number 1, which puts him just ahead of Mendelssohn and Mozart in the precocious category. <laughs> he was a classmate of Rachmaninoff's, both in composition and piano. And uh, upon graduation at the Moscow Conservatory, Rachmaninoff won the gold medal in composition and Scriabin the silver. Scriabin won the gold medal in piano and Rachmaninoff the silver. <laughs> And he then began a rather good career as, as a pianist, playing largely his own, but not only his own works. And then he became more philosophically adventurous, adventurous became a follower of uh, Blavatsky, the theosophist, and was very influenced by all sorts of movements at the time. He was, of course, for a while very impressed with Wagner, and then later, later not so much so, Nietzsche, and so on, he really felt that he was as much of a philosopher and a poet as a musician. But I can't speak for that, but I do know the music pretty well. <laughs> uh, he believed in salvation and transformation through art. And as I, as I said, he was a mystic, um, very seriously so. He also had something else, which is sort of a version of synesthesia, in which the wirings of the senses get a little bit crossed. And this was considered very strange in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, but Oliver Sacks has taught us that it's not quite as rare as we think. We know the power of light, of smell, of taste, of all these things. Um, Scriabin actually invented a color organ because he saw color with tonality, and he wanted some of his work's color to be projected on a screen uh, in back of the stage. He actually came up with the idea of sort of mm, smell -o vision by which aromas would be released from your, beneath your seats as certain harmonies or tones or passages were played. It, you know, it later became sort of a tacky thing, but he, I don't think he ever realized that one. But of course, we know from Proust and from, and from brain research that uh, the olfactory nerve is incredibly primal in our emotional response. So he was certainly onto something. Most importantly in music, he was one of the forerunners of the destruction, as it were, or the breakdown perhaps, of the tonal language. Not as organized as Schoenberg, of course, nobody was, but certainly <laughs> right there with Stravinsky and Bartok and Buzzoni and Debussy and many others. It was, it was what was happening in European music at that point. As a matter of fact, he felt that he had, of course, he felt he had the true way. And when, in his last work, The Mysterium, which, by the way, was nothing if not grandiose, it was to be performed with a cast of hundreds of thousands. On the, at the foothills of the Himalayas, <laughs> incorporating rite, ritual, chant, wordless choruses, moans, groans, poetry, light music, scent, dance, you name it. Um, and this was part of the transition of humanity's next to development to, to its next stage of consciousness. And he thought that this miracle would be accomplished largely through his art. And in fact, was, this is not meant to be funny, he was in fact overjoyed when World War I broke out because he felt this would be the cleansing cataclysm in which we could, we could shed the bad of the past and evolve into this sort of androgynous new beings that we are meant to be. Well, that hasn't happened yet, but um, <laughs> his, his tonal language 
is puzzling because when I play the first chord of Désir, Desire, the next piece, you might be forgiven for thinking that it's not by the same composer who wrote the pieces you just heard, because it's, it's a chord built on fourths to start with. Um, during his second, more heroic period, like Beethoven, he got more heroic and more adventuresome and more wild. And in the third period, which you'll hear some music of now, he totally went over the top into the other side. Rather, not unlike Beethoven, a composer he didn't like very much. But these are people, Promethean figures, who really wrestle with the very nature of the material of music and transform it. So this is one of the most puzzling things about Scriabin is this tonal language shift. But I think you'll discover as you listen that the personality is quintessentially the same. <laughs> 